series, This We Believe, the series given by Theodore Epp of Back to the Bible on our statement of faith. Here's Mr. Epp. Now once again we turn to our lesson and in our statement of faith, point number seven, the Christian life. We want to discuss that with you today, but first of all I'll read just what the statement of faith says about it. We believe that God expects every believer to live a life of obedience in which every area of his life is brought under the lordship of Jesus Christ. Now the fruit of the Spirit becomes increasingly evident in this life. The goal of the Christian life is to be conformed to the image of Christ, Romans 8.29. This life is characterized supremely First, by a self-giving love for God, and then secondly, the same kind of love for others. The life and the character of Christ in us, which grows through the Holy Spirit, is noticeably distinct from the life of the world. They're just not compatible between the life in the Holy Spirit and the life in the world. A believer who resists the gracious working of the Holy Spirit and fails to grow in obedience is chastened in infinite love by his heavenly Father so that he may learn obedience. Now let's go into the detail. Uh, The Back to the Bible doctrinal statement about the Christian life then emphasizes eight points that we want to cover. And uh, the primary aspects of our understanding of the believer's life Uh, as a Christian, after he has become a child of God. This is not, I'm not setting this up as a model for something to, uh, that we should ape after and then think we become Christians, but rather after we're Christians, this is what really is what we look at. Now the uh, Bible then, first of all, emphasizes that obedience to Christ and to his word is what constitutes the will of God for the believer. This is basic. In John 14, verse 21, we read, He that hath my commandments and keepeth them, he it is that loveth me. And he that loveth me shall be loved of my Father. And I better godly life and make him Lord in every particle of our life. In 2 Corinthians 10th chapter, verse 4 and 5, he says, For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, but mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, and every high thing that exalteth itself against the knowledge of God, and bringing into captivity every thought to the obedience of Christ. He gives us all of this, uh, all of the weapons, spiritual weapons, if you please, so that we might fight the battle casting down imaginations, bringing even our uh, thoughts into captivity. You say, I can't help but I think, oh, yes, you can. You can turn it over to him and say, Lord, my mind belongs to you. Now you take over. More of that at some other time. In James, the fourth chapter, verses 7 and 10, we read these words. Submit yourself, therefore, uh, uh, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he will draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, ye sinners, and purify your hearts, ye double-minded. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. Then in the third place, the Bible focuses on the results that take place in a life of each person who submits himself to the lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ, turning everything over to him, letting him be lord of your life. Now, these results are known as the fruit of the Holy Spirit, the divinely ordained character traits that the Holy Spirit works in our lives, which are produced thus by the Holy Spirit who lives in each believer to produce them. Note again Galatians 5, 22 and 23 where a cluster of nine uh, of grapes, let's call it, or nine uh, fruit uh, is mentioned to us. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace. This is inward fruit. Then outward fruit towards those who are around about us. Long-suffering, gentleness, and goodness. And then thirdly, fruit toward the Lord Jesus Christ or towards God. Faith towards God, 
meekness, and temperance. Against such there is no law. The Christian life is a life in which these traits become progressively evident. They're not going to be there altogether. No, I have lived quite a long time. In just a few weeks, I'll be 75. And and this month, we finish 50 years of full-time ministry. Yet, I must say that again and again and again, I checked myself by this cluster of fruit to see, am I allowing the Holy Spirit to work them in me? Am I allowing Jesus Christ to be Lord of my life completely? Well, they are progressively evident in the personal life of the believer then and in his relationship with God and thus with others. In uh, Ephesians, the fourth chapter, verse 22 to 24, he says that we shall put off concerning the former conversation the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind, that you may put on the new man, which after God is created in holy right, uh, tri- righteousness and in true holiness. This is a progressive thing in our Christian life. So do not become discouraged if you do not see everything just the way you want it right away. Confess your sin, confess your failure to God, and then go on, forgetting those things which are behind, reaching forth toward the goal that is set before you. Those are the words of of Paul uh, to us. Now, in the fourth place, we believe that the goal of the Christian life is to be conformed to the image of Jesus Christ. Now, although Christ is God, his life on earth as a man presented the flesh and blood model for the Christian life, not to be saved by, but to see what it is that God expects of a Christian, because this same Christ now lives in us by the Holy Spirit. The believer is expected to live in a Christ-like manner. Romans 8.29 says we are to be uh, in the image of him until we be conformed to the image of God. Or in 1 John 2.6, he that saith he abideth, In him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. The fact that the believer may not be able to attain perfectly to Christ's likeness does not therefore distract or belittle the value or the importance of the life of Jesus Christ as a model for him to follow. We are indwelt by him. Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ, nevertheless I live, yet not I. But Christ liveth in me. And the life that I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, uh, who loves me and gives himself for me. For this purpose, then, we are made new, that he indwells us, that he might show us and be our life in us. Then in the fifth place, the Bible emphasizes the supreme place that love has in the Christian's life. This is God's love, agape love. Love is seen in the Bible as holding priority over all other virtues in Christian living. In 1 Corinthians, the 13th chapter, we have a description of love. And first of all, he says, if I can do this and I can do that, and I can even talk in tongues of angels, or or I give away all my goods or give my body to be burnt, but if I have not love, I am nothing. But... On the other hand, he says, love abideth unto the end. 1 Corinthians 13, 3 says, And now abideth faith, hope, and love. These three, but the greatest of these is love. It is the supreme command of God that we love one another. Now, therefore, if it's commanded, it's got to be something that he has to work in us. Uh, Matthew, the 22nd chapter, verse 37 to 40, we read, Jesus said, said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy mind. This is the first and the great commandment, and the second is like unto it. Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets. So you see, it is God's command that we love first him and then also our fellow man. Love and thus summarizes the entire law of God. I turn, for instance, to Romans and the uh, 13th chapter, two verses that I want to read there. Love just summarizes. And uh, it, it, just when, when you fulfill love, you fulfill the law. Listen, owe no man anything but to love one another. 
For he that loveth another hath fulfilled the law. Verse 10. Love worketh no ill to his neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfilling of the law. This love is characterized by the giving of oneself, first to God, and then our, uh, ourselves to others and for others, even to the point of death when necessary. Following the example of Jesus Christ that he gave to us in 1 John 3, verse 16, Hereby perceive we the love of God, because he laid down his life for us. We ought to lay down our lives, then, he says, for the brethren. That's how much we ought to love the brethren. In the sixth place, then, the Bible states the truth that the Christian life cannot be lived through human efforts alone. It depends on the working of the Holy Spirit who is indwelling us and filling the believer to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which we talked about, and the life of Christ also to be produced in the believer. Note, for instance, what he says in 2 Corinthians 3 and verse 18. But we all, with an open face, beholding as in a glass the glory of the Lord, are changed uh, into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. Or as in Galatians 5, verse 16 and 18 and 25. This I say then, and note it please, walk in the Spirit or walk after the Spirit, follow the Spirit's direction. When he says something, just do it. Then he'll undertake, he'll give you the strength to do it. And ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. How can he say that? Because if you will follow him, he says, I will undertake and see you through all the way. Uh, for uh, if ye be led by the Spirit, ye are not under the law. You're not standing there being condemned. You're not standing there just being commanded. You are given the power. He says, I will undertake in your behalf. So verse 25 says, if we then live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Thank you for listening to Back to the Bible. Join us again tomorrow as we listen to Theodore M's message. God bless you.